there are times with the early 1980s, 2000 AD that one feels it was essentially doing this at everything. For a mainstream comic book, well, I'm using the term mainstream very loosely here, it excelled at putting its fingers up at everything. This was not really surprising considering the stable of writers included Pat Smittles, who was famous for his anarchic attitude and was responsible for action, a comic so violent it had been banned earlier. That's a comic we'll get round to eventually as well. It's infamous cover of a policeman being beaten with a chain by a young teenager <laughs> caused uproar in the 70s and was discussed in Parliament. But among the more strange and weird strips in the in 2000 AD at this time was Alan Moore's D.R. and Quinch. Alan, at the time, was an up-and-coming star, not the mega star of comics he is now, and somebody whose name is known even to, to much of the public who have no interest whatsoever in comics. With Alan Davis, who was also to become a huge star, they created a absolutely loony, anarchic universe. Let me read out the first few lines, because there's nothing better to describe it than that. My name's Ernie Quinch, a college student. I like guns and starting fights. My psychiatrist says I'm a psychotic de deviant. But that doesn't mean I'm a bad person, right? My best friend is Waldo Dobbs. Only everybody calls him DR, which stands for Diminished Responsibility. He came to college last term from reform school. We follow this up with the two characters travelling in time, causing the um, meteorite that kills the dinosaurs. Chucking apples off Newton's head, obviously the alternate idea about gravity, and getting involved in all sorts of early bits of of human history, including making sure the Mary Celeste was emptied, putting a banana peel on the moon for Neil Armstrong to slip on, and all sorts of wacky stuff. It's a completely anarchic and silly comic, but occasionally it has good points to make. There's a tone of sort of um, Douglas Adams mixed up with sort of science fiction, um, more hardcore science fiction, mixed up with a sort of James Dean movie gone wrong. Witness the judge trying a <laughs> pair of a protagonists. You are charged with arson, kidnapping, theft, grievous wounding, possession of unlawful atomic weapons. Taking and driving away, conspiracy to overthrow the government, coveting thy neighbour's ox, grave robbing, and 32 offences so unusual and horrible they do not have names. It's basically a rip-warring adventure across time with extreme silliness, which appeals to the anarchic senses of the writer. The two main characters are essentially galactic teenagers with unlimited ability to do harm. Here we have the lead, one of the lead characters' mums pop along the, into the series. At first you think it's a giant monster. Oh no, it's one of their mums, who then sits down for a cup of tea with the kids like mum does. It, fortunately, Alan Moore and Alan Davis also had the common sense to realise that such a series had an inbuilt limitation and you can't carry it on forever. And they ended it with a parody of Hollywood that's still fairly relevant <laughs> where you have on the left here people talking nonsense. BJ, can you hold? BJ, this is BJ. How about some R&R &R in my RV? We could listen to MOR on the FOM right into the AM. The jargon may have changed. The nonsense hasn't in Hollywood. It, you, the parodies of Marlon Brando may be slightly out of date, but the underlying assumptions of fame being bought by dodgy deals of a shallow world that is easy to poke holes in, are still all there. It ends with, uh, in the final series, with the two creators creating a, a movie um, about 16,000 oranges falling on people. You end with this lovely little parody of Barry Norman and Clive James, of course, big names on the TV in their day. Younger people probably won't recognise them as they've both been gone for too long. Clive James was particularly famous for his attempts to appear as, as intellectual as possible, which Moore has parody here with the um, this dialogue. Mind the origin of Marlin. Is it a cinematic soliloquy of citrus significance or a film noir fruit cocktail of fair dinkum phantasmagora? Who knows? Who cares? And anyone really clever enough to catch all the wee things I say? 
For those who remember a cry of James on telly, Morris caught his speech patterns brilliantly here and also how annoying he could be at times. It's one of the triumph, small triumphs of 2000 AD from this age, but it's of its age. It's a comic that could never be revived easily, and nor should it be. It's still well worth a read now, although some of the references I say are dated. But if you want to see two top flight comic creators early in their career, mucking about a bit and having a bit of fun, it's well worth a read. <laughs>